So welcome to Cognition. That's the second chapter, part two. This is part two. We're going to continue talking about ideas of cognition uh, that we started talking with last time. Mostly we talked about memory last time. Now we're going to get into some other forms of cognition. But first, let's do a check to see if you remember what we've talked about so far. The encoding process of memory involves... Encoding means taking things and putting them into long-term memory. So that's about recording information, okay? Putting it into the long-term memory. Keeping it there is maintenance, right? And then getting it back out is retrieving. So recalling is retrieving. So encoding is about recording the information, putting it into your long-term memory. So what we want to talk about today is actually about... Uh, we did our learning check. We're going to talk about automatic versus controlled processing and how our motivations and resources influence that. We're also going to talk about heuristics. Heuristics are shortcuts in decision making. And then we'll talk about some a little bit about metacognition and the theory of mind. And we'll mention a little bit about intelligence as well. Okay, first, are you a good multitasker? Now, if you remember, we've kind of already hit this a couple of times so far, both in the last chapter and in this chapter. If you said that you strongly agree, I'm afraid you're, you're just wrong. But you say, wait a minute, I know how to do lots of things at the same time. For example, I know how to ride a bicycle and uh, talk to my friend at the same time. I can drive a car while I'm singing to music and... Uh, talking to somebody else, all three of those, that's multitasking, right? Okay, well, that sometimes can be seen as multitasking, but it kind of depends on what you're discussing. If we're talking about things that take your attention away, new stuff, for example, you cannot really do more than one thing at the same time. You can try and switch your attention between two things, but you really can't do that. However, there are some tasks that don't require very much attention for you. They used to perhaps require a lot, but now they don't. So specifically, it depends on how we use our resources. So if you remember, we talked a little bit last time about cognitive load. Well, you, you have a limited amount of resources available to you that you can put to whatever you're processing, right? Whether it's remembering something, trying to memorize something, trying to think about something, you only have a certain number of cognitive, a certain amount of cognitive resources to put to those things. And that means that we don't use our resources for things that we don't care about. Motivation is a huge part of this. We use our motive, our, our resources for things that we're motivated about. Now you remember that penny that we talked about last time and how it was hard to recognize that this was the actual penny? Well, I'm sure that there's some people out there that actually do know what a, a real penny would, would easily have, have passed that test. Why? Because they care. Because they want to use their cognitive resources for that information. So for example, maybe a coin collector or perhaps somebody who works at the US Mint and is in quality control. They need to know exactly what it's supposed to look like. And therefore, they would be able to use the resources for that kind of information. I, and most of you, don't care. We know enough to distinguish a penny from a dime, but not enough to take the resources that, are, that, that we need, that we wanna use for other important things and put them towards a penny. Another good example of this is called the cocktail party phenomenon. Cocktail party phenomenon is based on the idea that you can go to a party and it's loud and people are talking to each other and everybody's having their own conversation and everything's going on, right? And you're having this conversation with somebody, it's really interesting, and then suddenly you hear your name, Ryan, and it catches your attention. Even though you weren't listening to their conversation before, suddenly you hear your name and boom, you pay attention to that. Why? Because you care about yourself. Humans, we, we tend to really care care about ourselves, And so we want to use our resources on things that are about us. There's suddenly my name, boom, my attention is there. I want to use those resources for that. Before, whatever they were talking about didn't matter. But as soon as they say my name, then the resources should go there. Let me give it a, a story uh, about this that's happened in, in my family. So my daughter, uh, I have one daughter. And one time my wife uh, said, hey, go get the, uh, go get um, go, go get our daughter some tights uh, from her drawer. So I come back and my mom, my mom, <laughs> my wife says, 
no, 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 those aren't tights. Those are leggings. I said, what? What's the difference? I had never cared about the difference between tights and leggings. Evidently, there is a difference. And, and since then, I've kind of learned, right? So if I'm remembering right, tights are technically a different kind of stretcher material. They often include the foot, but they don't necessarily have to. I, I'm still a little vague on some of these things, but there's a difference between tights and leggings. Now, I had heard the words tights and leggings, but I never used my cognitive resources to distinguish them. I never needed to because I don't care, right? I don't really care. Here's another story. One time we were looking, uh, my wife and I were looking online for some, you know, those little green army men. I was going to use it for an activity for one of my classes. And she's, so she's clicking through and she's like, oh, what about these? And I said, no, nah, I don't think I want those. Those are Germans. She said, what? I said, no, look, the, those are German army men. I said, what are you talking about German army men? Well, so look at her, the helmet. It's a German helmet. And she's like, what? You cannot tell the difference between army men based off of a helmet. Now, I am not a huge, like, army war buff, but I know enough to know the difference between a German World War II army helmet and an American World War II army helmet. And I was right, by the way. They were German, right? My wife doesn't care. She knows the difference between leggings and tights because she cares about those. And she's used her cognitive resources towards understanding the difference. I, for whatever reason, used my cognitive resources to understand the difference between an American and a German World War II army helmet. We use the resources that we have on the things that we care about. We care about ourselves, but there's other things that we care about. Now, what does this mean for you? There are certain things that we do that can become automatic or controlled, and it depends on how many resources they are going to take. The classic example is when you learn to drive. So for those of you who, who know how to drive, if you remember learning how to drive, perhaps you were with your parents, and the first time you were driving, you had to pay attention to everything, right? So where your foot was and how to hold this and lower, oh, man, there's things coming at you all the time, and you became overwhelmed. What happened is you were under cognitive load. All of those things were new operations. There were new things that you had to do. And so they required cognitive resources, a lot of resources. That is a controlled process or a controlled behavior because it requires a lot of control over your cognitive resources. There's a lot of things going on. And so there's a lot of new attention that you have to pay to. Over time, that behavior of driving can become automatic. Now, for those of you who've driven for a while, you know that every once in a while, if, you, if you're driving the same path, like from work to home, that sometimes you can kind of go and you're thinking about whatever you're thinking about and suddenly you're in your house and you're like, whoa, how did I get here? Something that used to take a lot of control and a lot of cognitive resources now takes very little. Why? Because you've basically created an automatic process that you know how to do those things. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you, you shouldn't have to pay attention when you're driving. In fact, when something happens that requires your attention, let's say like a deer runs in front of you, that is going to bring your attention right away. Okay? Automatically, you're controlling and you're using those resources to, to deal with the situation, in this case, the deer in front of you. But certain behaviors, especially routine ones, can go from controlled to automatic. This is not the case with new information that you're receiving. So for example, when you're studying, that's gonna be a controlled process every time, not because you haven't studied before, but because the actual information that's coming to you is gonna require your attention to process. That means that you cannot do something that's gonna require controlled process with something else that's gonna require a controlled process. If that's your version of multitasking, you're failing because you cannot pay attention to both of these things at the same time. You can switch attention, but you can't do it both at the same time. With an automatic process, you can do an automatic process while you're using your cognitive resources for something else. For example, driving and having a conversation. We're going to play a game. We're going to play categories or a version of categories. It's going to be very simple. So here's what we're going to do. I want you, as fast as you can, to think of a band a food, and a U.S. state that starts with the letter C. Ready, set, go. So, 
you thought of a band and you thought of a food and you thought of a U.S. state. So I'm glad that you could think of a band. So I think of Creedence Clearwater Revival, maybe for a band or a food, chocolate chip cookies. Mm, good. Now, all I really care about, though, is the U.S. state. For the example that we want to do, let's just work on the U.S. state that starts with the letter C. I want to know which one of these you chose because these are your only options. These are the only options that you could have chosen, California, Colorado, or Connecticut. Now, remember when we've talked about your memory and how you process information? We talked about how it's not a videotape and how it's not a file folder of pictures or anything else. Well, that's the same for piece of information when you have to answer this kind of a question. So for example, I'm in Colorado. And so when I ask this question, Colorado should be the one that most comes to mind. If your memory was kind of random, right, where you could pick a U.S. state, then California, Colorado, and Connecticut, they're all equally correct. And so you should get an equal number, right? Well, that's not true. Whenever you ask this, it seems like Connecticut is the one that's the least, at least unless, of course, you're like in Connecticut, right? But why would that be? They're all equally correct. Why would people choose Colorado more? And it seems kind of obvious. If you're in Colorado, you choose Colorado. But to answer the question, this, all of these are equally correct. So why would we choose one over the other? The answer has to do with accessibility of concepts. So here is the analogy we're gonna use. Pretend like your mind is a fish tank. And when I ask a question like, choose a state that starts with the letter C, you have to dip in and scoop out a uh, fish, which is an answer, right? That fits that category. Well, the stuff that's at the top of the fish tank is highly accessible. So for example, when I'm in Colorado, that's a fish that I've used pretty recently. and so. To fish out Colorado is pretty easy because it's at the top of the tank. I've used it recently. You put it in, you take it out, you put it back in, you take it back, it's all at the top of the tank. But things that you don't use as recently tend to be at the bottom of the tank, right? You don't fish them out very often, so they tend to sink to the bottom, stay at the bottom. They're harder to fish out. They are less accessible. Concepts are more or less accessible depending on how often you use them. So I use Colorado quite a bit because I'm in Colorado. It's highly accessible to me. I see Colorado all the time. I work at the University of Colorado. I look at my license. It's got Colorado. My license plate says Colorado. There's a lot of Colorado going on, right? Connecticut, I haven't lived there for a long time. I used to live in Connecticut, but I haven't lived there for a long, long, long time. And so it's not as accessible anymore. I don't use the, the word Connecticut very often or anything associated with it. The accessibility or the availability of information can be either high or low, depending on what's going on. Now, let's keep going with this. What could we do to make Connecticut more accessible? One way we could do it is just say the word Connecticut all the time. Connecticut, 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 Connecticut. That's one way we could do it, and that would make it more accessible. But I don't have to do that. I don't have to just say Connecticut over and over and over and over again. Instead, I can just mention things that are associated with Connecticut because like fish, our memories don't swim alone. They swim in, in groups, in schools. So for example, this is the school of fish around the concept that I have of Kentucky. So the state of Kentucky, I associate with the Kentucky Derby. So that's a separate concept, Kentucky Derby. I associate with basketball because you know I'm old and Kentucky and basketball go together, and KFC, because KFC stood for, at least, Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? That was what KFC stood for. So if we want somebody to think about Kentucky, what we're saying is they don't have to just say Kentucky, 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 Kentucky. What they can do instead is let's talk about fried chicken, and let's talk about uh, basketball, and let's talk about horse races. We don't have to say the word Kentucky at all. But because we're talking about those other things, everything associated with it becomes more accessible. The collection of things that go together, like the school of fish, is what we call a schema. A schema. 
all the pieces of information that are associated with a concept. That's the schema. So for example, if you look at the schema, this is a schema for elephant. Pachyderm is another word for element, elephant. Dumbo is an elephant. The elephants live in Africa. Elephants eat peanuts. All those, all peanuts, all those things are associated with elephants. So this is a schema of elephants. And so if I want somebody to think about elephants, I can just talk about Dumbo and Africa and peanuts, and then all of it becomes more accessible. This process of making something more accessible, taking something from low accessibility to high accessibility is called priming. Priming is the process of making a concept more accessible. And when you make a schema more accessible, everything associated with it also becomes primed. It becomes more accessible. So a schema is a mental structure that includes beliefs, other information about a concept or class of objects. It's all the information about that concept. And priming then is making it more accessible. Now I want you to look at this schema and tell me what it's a schema of. Now I'm not gonna make you answer. But if you said women, you are a sexist. No, I'm kidding, I'm gonna hold on. Let's talk about this. There are many kinds of schemas. Now remember, schemas are mental structures that include beliefs and other information about a concept or class of objects. So let's say that this was a schema about women. Do you say, no, that's not, a, that's not real, that's not true. That's a stereotype. Well, guess what? Stereotypes are schemas about groups of people. A stereotype is a version of a schema. And the other thing is, you do not have to believe it. You don't have to believe any of those things in order for them to be in the schema. So you don't have to believe that women are nurturing, moody, kind, or bad at math, as long as those concepts have been connected to the concept of woman in your brain, then it becomes a schema. A stereotype is a form of a schema. And unfortunately, that also means that these stereotypes and things that are connected, even though you may not believe them, may become primed as you are primed with women, for example, or whatever the group happens to be. So for example, I'm a white man. There is a, uh, there is a stereotype that white men can't jump. And so part of the schema of me as a white man includes can't jump. Now, whether or not that's true doesn't matter. It's still part of the schema, it's still part of the schema. And it can affect me or it can affect other people who interact with me based on their expectations, whether they realize it or not. Let's talk about decision-making. How do you make your decisions? Well, you say, oh, well, I always make really good decisions. I make my pros and cons list and I think about it and I make sure I make the best decision. And that's not true. That's not true at all. I know you don't do that. Sometimes you do. But most of the decisions you make, you probably make pretty quickly, right? What to eat, what to wear, what to whatever, right? Most of those things, you don't want to spend a bunch of those cognitive resources making those kinds of decisions. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through some examples of decisions, and you're going to, you're going to make some decisions. Now, in this case, the decision is just going to be answering a question. Answering a multiple choice question, answering any question, is a form of decision making. You have to decide what a correct answer might be. Okay. Most of those decisions, though, are probably not very important to you, not enough for you to make an exhaustive list of all the possible pros and cons, right? Instead, you might take a shortcut. So let's let's do some examples. Which of these is the most common cause of death in the United States? Which of, of this list, which one's most common? The actual answer to this question is stroke. Stroke is the most common form of cause of death in the United States. Now, I did not intend for you to go and Google the correct answer for this. What I intended for you to do is just answer. Just answer, I don't know, uh, I'll guess, uh, and then you make your guess. Many people, especially when we're talking about college-aged people, choose suicide as the most common cause of death in the United States among these. In reality, stroke, diabetes, and Alzheimer's are all much more common forms of death in the United States. Now, I don't want to under, under I don't want to say that suicide is not important, and I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that 
stroke, diabetes, and Alzheimer's result in more deaths than suicide in the United States. But why would somebody choose suicide as the correct answer in this case? Well, often that's because of how often you hear about suicide. Especially if you're college age, you're much less likely to hear somebody say, oh, do you know so-and-so died of diabetes the other day? We, we don't hear about that because it unfortunately becomes pretty common, right? And tends to, um, tends to affect older people, et cetera. But suicides uh, are tragedies. And they and they cause a lot of uh, a lot of people talk about them. Sometimes there's uh, media about it, etc. And so those things are more available. They're more accessible in our brain. Why? Because we remember hearing about them more often. Here's a second question: Where is Brian from? So let me tell you about Brian. Brian's easygoing. He attends a state college in New York. He's tan and he likes to go to the beach. So you tell me, where is Brian from? These are your options. Now, you've never met Brian, but you should have picked New York. You're like, what? I chose California. There are sometimes stereotypes that we use about people in order to make decisions. So for example, Brian is easygoing, tan and likes the beach. Well, those are stereotypes that are associated with California. However, anyone who attends a state college in New York, 90% of the people who attend a state college in New York are from New York. So objectively, the most likely answer is going to be New York. However, sometimes we like to make our decisions not based off of objective piece of information, but instead on stereotypes, schemas that we have about groups of people. And if I know that in this case, Brian likes going to the beach and stuff, well, oh, people in California, they go to the beach all the time. You can live in Nebraska and still like to go to the beach and be easygoing and tan, but we have a stereotype that that fits California. Now, in this particular case, the objective information that you should have used was that he's from a state university, he goes to state university in New York, and 90% of the people do. So objectively, that's the most likely answer. Okay, for this one, we're going to split you into two groups. So tell me the last digit of your phone number. All right, you chose your last digit of your phone number was odd. So here's what I want you to tell me. How many computers have you owned in your lifetime? All right, you chose that the last uh, digit in your phone number is even. So I want you to answer this question. How many pencils have you owned in your lifetime? Now I want you to answer this question. How many countries are in the European Union? Okay, now for this, I don't, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, it's, is it 18 or 28? I can't remember. <laughs> I think it's 28. I can't remember how many are in the European Union. Maybe it's only 18. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is that you saw different things depending on if you were in the odd group or the even group. Specifically, let's, let me show you this. If you were in the odd group, I asked you how many computers you've owned in your lifetime. If you were in the even group, I asked how many pencils you've owned in your lifetime. What happens is we tend to arbitrarily uh, focus on a number. So if I'm asking you a number, like how many countries are in the European Union, you tend to focus on a number that you've heard recently and then adjust from there. So if I ask how many computers you've owned, you've probably not owned you know, 50 different computers, right? So you've probably owned hundreds of pencils. And what happens is when you have to, op when you have to consider how many countries are in the European Union, you need, what you do is you say, all right, well, let's think. I got to think of a number. Well, I just did how many computers? I've only owned like four computers in my life. So I know four is too low. So it must be a little bit more, uh, maybe 12. First is somebody who said, oh, pencils. Oh, okay, I got to think of a number. Pencils. I, I just thought about pencils. I've owned like 3,000 pencils. I know there's not 3,000 countries in the European Union. I'm going to adjust down. So maybe, I don't know, 43. What we've just gone through are examples in 
heuristics. Heuristics are shortcuts in decision making. We use heuristics in order to conserve resources so that we can think about stuff we care about, like, like uh, I don't know, like watching TV and, uh, and stuff like that instead of stuff we don't care about, like how many countries there are in the European Union. The three different heuristics that we've just demonstrated are the availability heuristic, the representativeness heuristic, and anchoring and adjustment. Availability heuristic is the example of the most common cause of death in the United States. We tend to make decisions based off what's readily available in our brain. So for example, hearing about death by suicide is readily available in your brain. It's more available than uh, people who die by because of diabetes. Therefore, you're more likely to use that as uh, the decision making. All right, whatever is most available to me, that'll be the right answer. Representativeness is when we use a stereotype in order to answer a question. So for example, Brian is tan and easygoing and likes going to the beach, but he's also from, he also goes to a state college in New York. Well, instead of focusing on an objective number, something that's objectively more likely, like the fact that 90% of the people uh, who go to a state college in New York actually are from New York. Instead, we focus on the stereotype and we answer based off of whatever stereotype we have about that group. Anchoring adjustment is what we did with the numbers. If you thought about the number of computers you owned, you had four computers, and so uh, you adjust up, but you don't adjust enough. It becomes an anchor and you adjust from that anchor. So the first number, four computers, becomes an anchor for the next number you need to figure out how many countries in the European Union, but you don't ever adjust enough. You're anchored to that first number. Conversely, if you've owned 3,000 pencils in your life, and then you know that you need to figure out how many European Union countries there are, you know it's not 3,000, but you never quite adjust enough. You're still anchoring mentally on that number. We need to talk about intelligence. Intelligence is difficult to define, right? We need to talk about the difference between G and multiple intelligences. So G stands for general intelligence. Normally when we think about something like an IQ test, we're thinking about your general intelligence. This is the concept that somebody has a general form of intelligence and that's it. Multiple intelligence says that, hey, you can have musical intelligence that is different than your math intelligence, that's different than your emotional intelligence, which is different than the whatever kind of intelligence. So multiple intelligences versus general intelligence. Some people think that intelligence is just broad, right? And whatever people, if somebody's very intelligent, they can be prolific in any form of those other kinds as long as they're motivated to do so. Other people say that, hey, no, my ability to do math is distinctly different from my ability to perform music. They're totally separate. They're separate abilities, separate intelligences. When we look at the actual data of what, uh, you know, of, of evidence of what people do and what they don't do, we get some different ideas. But let me ask you what you think first. Do you really think that multiple intelligences are qualitatively distinct? That means that your musical intelligence is totally separate from your math intelligence, for example. Do you think that the different kinds of intelligence are totally separate from each other? If you agreed with this statement, then you're, you're advocating uh, against what we call G. G is general intelligence. It would say that your intelligence for music is the same as your intelligence for math. It just matters what kind of motivation you have. Based off the data that we are currently look at, and there's a lot of data that we're still gathering about intelligence, but a lot of the data really does not support multiple intelligences. It seems that people who are able to do one thing are often able to do other things. Now, sometimes they don't do those other things because they just don't want to, right? They're not motivated to spend their resources on those, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't. And so intelligences, G tends to be a little bit more supported by the data than multiple intelligences. The last thing we need to talk about is comparative cognition. And we're gonna talk about theory of mind actually in a different chapter, but comparative cognition is when we compare human cognition to other species. So other species, for example, 
when we look at a chimpanzee, right? A chimpanzee is another species. What we do is we compare our intelligence, our cognition, our ability to process information to other species to see what they can and cannot do. So theory of mind is the idea that I have a theory that you have a mind. It, it's saying that my ability to understand that you have your own point of view is what we call theory of mind. And so when we understand different species, it helps us to understand the concept of theory of mind in us. So for example, we have found, we've been able to find that chimpanzees can pass theory of mind tasks, whereas other species cannot. Now, why might that be? So one reason might be because uh, chimpanzees are genetically more similar to humans, but there might be other reasons as well. And by understanding the different ways that different species uh, can process information helps us understand how we as humans process information as well. All right, let's do a couple of review questions. So, memory is stored in an organized collection of related concepts that are linked together. This is an example of Okay, so the organized collection of related concepts is called a schema. It is true that a stereotype is an example of a schema, but a schema is the correct answer to this particular question. More people are afraid of flying than driving because plane crashes get a lot of attention. This would be an example of, this is an example of availability heuristic. If they get a lot of attention, then Hearing about a plane crash is more available in your mind, even though uh, actually car crashes are much more uh, common, right? But because we tend to hear more about plane crashes than car crashes, like on the news, it's more available in our brain. And so we're more likely to uh, say that car crash, or excuse me, plane crashes are more common because it's more available to us. It's been primed, it's more accepted. All right, thanks everybody.